What's up guys and welcome back to Young to Live By. Now today I'm joined by Just Steve, not Steve and Pauline unfortunately of course, Just Steve, to talk about complexes because it's a topic we've brought up several times on the channel but we realise we've not made a video yet detailing specifically what complexes might be. So I thought it would be a nice idea to have a little conversation about it. So I guess to kick things off Steve, what is a complex? And I do because I've seen it be, be described as complex and as a state dependent memory learning behavior and all other kinds of things. But if you were to give, like we did with the anima and other things, a quick definition of what a complex is, what would it be? Ah, indeed. There's the mystery of mysteries because these things are so elusive and yet so tacitly a part of us that they're very, very easy to miss. Obviously, the conventional way of looking at them is that the ideas that are acquired through association and joined together by associative or learning processes and they're joined together by a common emotional tone uh, and that's what you get if you look into young at, at a basic level they're much more than that and what you actually see of them will depend very much on how you approach them and i prefer to think of them as being if you like just aspects of the psyche which are not part of your ego unless you identify with them uh, that they have a degree of autonomy away from conscious control uh, as Jung himself found and we've confirmed as well using different methods to him they have a physiological profile again all of their own uh, but also that they extend into all of our relationships as well so basically then, if you can be basic about such things, they're functional units of the psyche that are related to memory and to learning, but they're not passive, they're active, they have a degree of autonomy all of their own, and in that sense you can separate them off from ordinary memory. Ordinary memory might just be a bank that you can access, if you like, and to withdraw recall of past events from, and then just put them back where you got them from, basically, by no longer attending to them but what makes complexes different although they are related to memory is that they can have an autonomy all of their own in other words they can function outside of your conscious will and intention indeed they can be said in some cases to have a purpose all of their own even an autonomy to the degree that you could treat them almost as separate personalities now by that I don't mean complete personalities, but as Jung himself said, partial personalities. So I wouldn't want to reify them to the extent that you know the, these things are like sub or multiple personalities. They're not. They're not. Uh, but they can function as if they were. And that is a very subtle distinction that we should make. If we over-reify them and endow them with more autonomy than they really do have, and they have enough... But if you give them more by suggesting to yourself or to others that they have a complete personality of their own, then you're auto-suggesting yourself into something which could be problematic, very, very problematic. So it's best to think of them as functional units of the psyche that for the most part are separate to your awareness, to your ego or ego, which is the nuclear complex of your field of consciousness within which you also find your self-reference frame, your self-concept, the internal mirror that you look in and recognize yourself by. So mostly they're separate to that, but also there are different kinds of complex which can be connected to the ego or to the ego completely. And that, that's a different thing. I'm sorry that there's no actual easy explanation for what they are as soon as you try and reduce them down you start to lose resolution and lose explanatory power it's a kind of thing you can only really meet in practice and understand by interacting with them it's interesting that you would want to come out and say you know don't elevate them up because if indeed it's something it's so strange isn't it because it's not as if we can give a lecture or something like that on pure theory because it's not just pure theory it's uh, it's it's living things and it, ex ex exactly as you said when you're talking to somebody else and a complex poses a problem in a therapeutic scenario then you've got to be careful what you say to those people which which is certainly interesting but um are, uh, does everybody have complexes at all times always yeah I, I, absolutely there's no real way of learning other than being an automaton 
if you don't have complexes. Complexes do gift us with some plasticity and bandwidth in terms of res potential responses. Um, so complexes are normal, and it, thank you for reminding me that that should be emphasised. Um, they definitely function pathologically too, but our latent potential forms complexes as well. Latent as in the aspects of our potential that we haven't brought out will form functional units and they will attempt to push themselves into consciousness and be integrated into the into the ego, into ego consciousness. Of course the problem can be if those complexes that try to push their way in are more of a pathological nature. But you also get ambivalent complexes as well. It, it, it's, it's a minefield really, so you can start at a superficial level of trying to understand what they are, but it really is only by interaction with them. And that interaction can include a separation from them where they have been incorporated into your self-reference frame, your self-concept, inappropriately, where they might act like a virus, if you will, uh, and then force you to replicate their emotions, their ideas, their ideation, and also change your behaviour and the behaviour of others, because like an infection, they will want to infect other people too. And they do this through suggestion. Suggestion is influence. And if a particular complex can occupy your idea of who you are and then force you to influence other people according to its ideas, emotions and feelings and so on, you can actually infect someone with your own complexes. And then, of course, if you're another person, a third party, you can be infected by someone else's psychology. And what you're infected by are their complexes. So the viral analogy is a pretty good one. Yeah, similar to Richard Dawkins' meme analogy in that particular way, an idea that, that propagates it itself. That's interesting, and you can pick up this idea of psychological in infections, and of course that's why a therapist would have to be as clean as possible before going in out of, I guess, a hubris or something, thinking they can they can cure people. Or indeed gurus, and of course I've, I've done, I've ranted about gurus on this channel as well. It's like, that was one of the reasons, it's like, maybe gurus can help people. It's like, yeah, sure, maybe they can, but also maybe they can spread their own complexes onto other people. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, complexes can exist at a psychocultural, sociocultural level as well, and they do. Any kind of belief which would not have an existence at all if nobody knew about it, once people know about it and therefore learn and acquire it, that then incorporates as a complex within that person. They can identify with it, and if a group of people do, then collectively they identify with it, and in effect you have a collective complex. Not something that Jung would talk about particularly, but it's demonstrable, we can all see it. So any, any kind of uh, collectively held belief that is acquired rather than arises innately from within a person is a complex and in fact as soon as it generates from one person even if it comes from within in effect it's a complex because it's communicated psychosocially so there are you know some rather loose boundaries between these uh, orthodox Jungian definitions on things but yeah you can have a collective complex that's social psychosocial psychocultural and it can take many forms you can have a, a psychological level of analysis, description and explanation and just talk about how ideas and emotions work through complexes. Then you can add a psychophysiological uh, element to this and talk about how psychologies, uh, complexes affect our physiology, and they do. So they exist simultaneously at all of these different levels, which is an interesting phenomenon because it raises the question of where people begin and where they end. It's certainly not with their psychology. I was thinking that the reason why people would come to these videos is one of two reasons. One is like psychological development and the other is because they're trying to study psychology. And of course, if you're trying to study psychology, the videos make sense anyway. But for self-development people, would it be fair to say that complexes pose a problem when they get in the way of your own individuation? Just I know, I know that's kind of a crude thing to say, but put that out as a general rule and then maybe a way into detecting whether or not you're on your own individuation journey properly, if, you're, if it's unfolding at an appropriate pace, is whether or not you're suffering from something. But then, of course, that's when things get, you know, I could say, for example, depression, anxiety, symptoms like, like that, or indeed some biological problems could be the result of a, of a complex. But when it comes to like latent potential and you're running around as somebody else you shouldn't be, it's difficult to define that in terms of suffering, you know? But it, with that definition about 
they get in the way of individuation, therefore they are bad. Would that be fair to say? Again, you have to go on an individual basis and, and uh, assess overall how someone is functioning. Um, it's inevitable that we, we gain negative complexes, absolutely, because they're, they're just a fact of conditioning. So as we grow and develop, i.e. as we, we head towards individuation, under instinctive pressure, when you collide with the outer world, you're going to have learned experiences which will then form complexes, which, as I say, are registered, if you like, at a physiological level, at a psychological level, and a psychosocial level. So it's inevitable that we're going to collect these things along the way. The thing is that as we learn and acquire them, that's how they gain their, if you like, resemblance to being a partial personality, as in a split off part of us. So if we acquired a particular complex, say as a child, then it's quite possible that the overall ambience of that particular complex will be childlike, infantile even, in terms of the way that it formed associations, in the way that it expresses emotion, and in the way that it makes demands for satisfaction. You'll find that as people age, the character of their newly acquired complexes to some extent reflects where they're at in their personal development at the time the complex arises. So that, that's something else that, that you know, uh, clinically you can look for in terms of your own personal development as well is what kind of character does this complex have? That will give you a clue as to when it was formed. So yeah, we're under instinctive pressure to develop. This comes from the genome. And that pressure then develops through relationships and it starts with the, the parents, principally the primary caregiver, whoever that is. But for the sake of statistical normatives, we can say it will be the mother. Which is why, if you like, the mother complex can metaphorically, and not in any judgmental sense, be considered to be the mother of all complexes because that's the primary relationship, the primary two-person and therefore psychosocial relationship that you have with your mother will produce the mother of all complexes. That doesn't mean to say it's bad because, you know, very often complex, in fact, in, I'd say pretty much in most cases, if not all, complexes like most things that Carl Jung goes on about are bipolar in the sense that they have a positive and a negative pole, a positive and a negative aspect or attribute. And the trick is that once you interact with them is to understand to what extent the negative really is negative and it's not just a form of encouragement to change and to what extent what appears to be positive may actually be some kind of seductive trap that keeps you locked in. That, for instance, is why I have some issues with so-called inner child work. Um, it's a big subject all on its own, that, but I, I tend, if you like, on balance to believe and to practice in such a way that I would encourage people to avoid doing inner child work. If you access a complex that, that was fixated at a particular age, then in terms of outcome, its value is only in that complex maturing and therefore dissolving and releasing its energy back into the psyche away from just being tucked away and in service of itself. So, if you pardon the pun, it's complicated, complex, if you like, to deal with these things and you have to understand an awful lot if you really want to get down and understand them in any meaningful depth. Yes, okay, so if I'm going to alter that initial statement that I made then, it's the, so it's a, you've got someone who's going on a journey and they're under, as you said, instinctual pressure from the genome in order to develop. They want to come out, but as in themselves will want to come out and and um, de de develop. So you've got, so for example, a mother complex in this case, you're going to have good bits of that, which are going to be beneficial to you and your, ad and your adaptation. It's the negative side of those complexes, which are going to stop your genomic self from manifesting. Would that be correct? Yeah, definitely. You know, with, uh, with mothers, you get down to attachments as well, attachment issues. Uh, and also the, the, the basis of forming your own identity as a child comes from your relationship to your mother first because there's an attachment and then there's a separation which defines your individuality. So how that's handled psychosocially in relationship to the mother but also the father will very much determine on how you begin to relate. And it's at that point that the anima, in, in Jungian terms, as a relating function 
shifts off the mother and out into the world. So you can see how these things start to, to get blurred and, and to cross over in terms of what the actual turf is, if you like, in, in a metaphorical sense. So your anima complex, your relating complex, is learned from your mother complex. It's abstracted from that first and then it's transferred over and it's generalised. Yeah? Uh, it, it also passes through a phase of attachment to the father, any siblings, and then the wider social experiences as you begin to grow. So the complex is adjusting all of the time. But there may be certain aspects of it which are shaped, triggered, however you want to think of it, at an early enough stage to cause either a problem or to solve problems later on. There'll be an inclination towards meeting certain experiences in life problematically or not problematically, perhaps, based on how you learnt to relate on the basis of your actual experience to your caregivers at an early stage in your life. So these relationships are very, very important. Lots of other things start to coalesce around that early experience of uh, your first uh, primary caregiver as well. You can talk, if you like, about Jungian archetypes and talk about the mother archetype and then maternal instincts, the instinct that the child has to relate to a caregiver for food, for nourishment, protection and so on. All of these things get really blurred and you can choose the lens that you want to to adopt the appropriate resolution. You know my position on this, and I know lots of people who watch our videos do too, that in some respects, the archetypal so-called layer of resolution is unnecessary, even at this early stage. All you really need to consider are instincts which pressure you and your primary caregivers as well to relate to you as a child, and then the complex that forms in the child and the complex which is um, modified by the experience of having the child in the mother and the father and also the adjustments in the family from siblings if there are any. So it is complicated but the resultant effects whatever their cause are all at the level of complexes. The archetype itself is that very very elusive thing which operates somewhere between instinct and complex. But remember we're under instinctive pressure to progress towards individuation, towards maturation and then all of our adaptations and maladaptations resultantly are our complexes. So when perhaps later in life we encounter the idea that archetypes exist, you can then look back and superimpose that on a situation which doesn't need that level of analysis, description and explanation. Because what we're really looking at is the genomic expression of instincts in a situation, the nuclear situation of the family, and then the complexes that arise from that. That is enough in terms of psychopathology and in terms of understanding individuation. Once we start to introduce archetypes into the equation, it does get complicated if you separate them from instincts. Uh, and that's something which over the decades I've learned is not very useful at all. You need to be able to keep in mind what instincts are operating, what instincts have been frustrated and then how they help to shape the complexes because it's our instinctive push, as I say, against the environment fundamentally that produces the complexes. For example, in the mother-child relationship, a child is under instinctive pressures to bond with the mother for survival and for nourishment and if that is not met appropriately, then a complex forms. The child isn't concerned about an archetype, has no idea what an archetype is, it's just a concept that many of us meet in early adulthood perhaps. But the child is definitely motivated by its instincts and the result of that clash is a complex which is then carried forward. As I say, the so-called anima complex, which is the, the nuclear complex of relating across the whole board, psychosocially, is learned in that early encounter with the primary caregiver. It may well be that there are two men bringing up a child, in which case the anima complex will take on the image, the imago, of a male caregiver. It's not particularly selective about how that is fleshed out. It depends on the actuality of the experience. So people need to move away from this idea that the anima in a man is necessarily female in appearance, only in a statistical normal sense. 
And of course, you could get two female caregivers as well, primary caregivers. And again, it complicates things, but in a specific way. It doesn't generally reverse the function of relating at all. And we give the relating function the term anima or animus, but they're only labels of convenience. If you look down at function, the how people actually do something, that's the most important thing. And if you're looking for early years pathology, in other words, how these complexes arise, then you can see that in terms of relationship, as that relationship has been pushed instinctively, and then you get a product, which is the complex. Now, overall, a mother only has to be good enough to be effective. And then other instincts will take over and the child at the appropriate moment, and then they, he or she, will be pushed to go out into the environment and actualize other anticipated instinctive behaviors and uh, fulfillments, because instincts are teleological. But the results of these encounters, as I say, are complexes, either new ones or modifications, or where two or more complexes will, perhaps for a while, perhaps only momentarily, literally, link up and then separate again, and some of them will move into consciousness and be identified with, and some of them will fall away. This is the normal turnover. It gives us plasticity and bandwidth in adaptation. But some complexes are pathological, really pathological, rather than just useful things, useful ways of adaptating and, and of uh, being able to access memory and learning and so forth. And they're the problem. They're the things that get really in the way. And when you're trying to solve issues from the past that may have happened with respect to parenting or other aspects of adaptation, it is complexes you have to deal with as the symptomatic expression of maladaptation. But behind them are the instincts. So there's a number of ways you can deal with complexes. You can deal with them as complexes, literally, or you can sidestep them and get directly to instincts because if you can access them you can blow complexes away. So there's a number of ways you can deal with them but fundamentally in terms of early life relationship they all, they all cluster around instincts and then later we might form the hypothesis that such a thing as archetypes exist but when you think about it they're still learned images as well. There's still ways that we associate to ourselves either through the culture or through self-talk or whatever that there is such a thing as an archetype and basically at that point if we're not careful we're creating a deep structure complex around an image which gets in the way of us and the instinct that we may need to access. Of course on the positive side we may be able to use that image to access the instinct directly. But archetypes in and of themselves are fairly inert. The real power is in the genome and in the, in, and in the instincts. And the real impediment is in the complexes. So don't get distracted by these archetypal images from whatever source they may be acquired. Do we know anything about the, um, at what resolution complexes exist biologically? In terms of, so, so, so for example, uh, we, we discussed this briefly in terms of archetypes before, in, it might have been the shadow video that we did, but someone could have, say, a lifelong complex. Does that mean it will be encoded genetically? Because that doesn't make any sense, considering complexes aren't inherited genetically. Presumably they would, they're, they're passed psychosocially rather than, you know, I inject you with a complex. Maybe you could. I don't, I don't know if you've ever actually tried. There are cases of um, organ transplant you may have heard of this, I don't know if you have or not, but please look it up. There are anecdotal reports from people who've had organ transplants where they've acquired memories of the donor's life that have been verified, allegedly. Now that is a staggering thing to consider. That, that makes perfect sense, because it will be at the biological level, without, without a doubt. I'm just wondering at what, if there was any information on what resolution it would exist, if it was genetic, if it was epigenetic, if it was prion, for example, or just other kinds of protein. You, you are the geneticist, obviously, out of the two of us, far and away. You're a PhD level, so there's absolutely no, no way that I can compete with that, nor would I want to. But in terms of from, from my own field, my understanding is, uh, from Jung's modelling, it is entirely possible to pass on learned behavior um, individually acquired learned behavior now he he didn't want to be accused of Lamarckianism you know uh, over that but in my experience clinically 
an anima type, in other words, a preference. This is an example. An anima type is a preference for a, of the kind of woman that you may imprint upon that's independent of individual learning, may well be inherited and uh, passed on. Um, and that must be, I guess, at a genetic level, unless we're going to hypothesize another kind of transmission. So you have that, you've got the organ transplant issue as well. Then if you go up to the level of um, the brain and the nervous system and, and, and so forth, obviously there's going to be a neurological correlate. And again, I think that's a useful level to look at things because there are going to be cortical networks, neural networks, which are involved in learning and in complexes, and they will have to be operating for a complex to exist. But there'll be subcortical pathways as well, uh, because there's a psychoneuroendocrine, psychoneuroimmune pathway that's involved in state-dependent memory learning and behaviour. Um, there'll be a gene expression level. So, you know, biologically, it's represented at many, many different levels. You know, you, you've got somebody in therapy, a patient of yours, for example, and you want to try and reintegrate, you want to get rid of a complex. So you want them like biologically to be reintegrated, whatever's making up that neural circuit. Can When you eradicate a complex like that, can it be instant? Because if it's instant biologically, that makes no sense. You'd have to have a latency period where you've triggered something through your words for that neural network to have been decayed and then reintegrated, right? Can they be instant? Because that's a good thing to talk about, at least behind well, the that's scenes. A, that's, um, that's an interesting uh, question. My experience where you can uh, apparently switch something off very quickly is that it, at a specific level, yes, and that's at a psychological level where you get a disconnect occurring. Without wishing to suggest anything, because it's always dangerous to suggest things because people will misinterpret it, but like you say, the, um, the physiological level will probably be there, but there is a dissociation psychologically between the two, which allows that adjustment to occur at a physiological level so that it does dissipate. Um, but a, a psychological disconnect can, can allow that, but you can come the other way as well. If there's um, a strong physiological element, a neuroendocrine element to do with whatever um, endocrine profile it might be involved, whether it's cortisol, adrenaline, or a mixture of the two, uh, a strong emotional uh, presence, fear, if you like. If that can be suppressed, then you'll find that the ideas start to break down because that is no longer there. So you can take that bottom-up perspective in order to get to psychology. Um, that's usually very quick because once the, the ideation realises there is no root left in the body, it will begin to spontaneously disassemble. If you take a top-down cognitive approach, you then get a dissociation between the ideas and the symptoms. Now, just to give you an example, which is not specifically about a complex, but it can be treated that way. Uh, if you use hypnosis to remove smoking behavior, for example, you, you, you have an addictive element in smoking, you have a habit element. The addictive element in the old days was considered a compulsion. They used to assess it by saying, is this habit or compulsion? And of course, it's always both, but they would always ask that question, the old, old school hypnotherapists. And what you would aim to do is to get the, the body physiologically to dissociate from the habit, although the habit is there because of the chemical dependency. That's what causes the loop. And it is possible to put people into a state whereby they feel completely at ease and without any need at all uh, for nicotine. So the idea that the ideas start to accelerate, it's really strange. What you will see is that, that there's a multiplication of ideas, the pressure, if you like, cognitively to try and grasp back hold of the physiological symptoms to make sense of why the ideas are there. But if that disconnect is there, after a while, the ideas go, well, fuck it. And they just, pardon my language, and they then separate, dissociate, break down, and whatever energy was being put into sustaining that neural network dissipates and is gone. Now, if you can sustain that separation, people can get off nicotine addiction very, very quickly. It's actually harder with alcohol than it is with cigarettes, uh, in my experience. And it's, it's harder again with other kinds of drug too. Because there's usually a much bigger and wider network of associations that goes into those particular 
addiction, shall I say, than there is with cigarettes. Even though there is a strong repetition compulsion with, with, with nicotine and that kind of thing. But back into context, it's a, it's a reasonable analogy because smokers do have a smoking complex which is connected to their self-esteem. It's usually an ego-identified, an ego-identified in corporate. So within the person's self-concept, it is, I am a smoker, for example. Therefore, I can't stop because otherwise I'm giving up me. So if you can separate that, uh, and if you can separate the ideas from the physiological state, then you can break it right down. And moving away from smoking, but carrying the analogy over, it is similar with complexes as well. They can be very widely distributed physiologically, psychosocially, cognitively, very, very widely dissociated and separated. So you'd be running down rabbit holes all over the place trying to chase these things. But there are ways of accessing them quite quickly and then beginning to sever the, the, contacts, uh, the contacts between them. When you do that, they will begin to spontaneously break down. So some of them you can approach cognitively, which is what CBT tries to do, although they do have very elementary physiological methods of relaxation and so forth. But it, it, it tends not to work as effectively as it could because they don't utilise the right methods. You know, there's a, there's a lot of reasons uh, uh, behind that. So, yeah, you know, if, if you're dealing with complexes, you need to know what you're up against, how widely distributed it is within that person's psyche, within their body and with their social functioning and their relating, what instincts are powering them and so forth. And there are so many, many different ways of doing it. So the, the art as a therapist is the rapport insofar as you understand what you're up against and you communicate to a complex that you know what you're up against. Um, and then being able to deal with the resistance that inevitably comes from complexes because, if you like metaphorically, they will fight to survive. And some of the work that we've done together behind the scenes on myself, for example, that's, um, that's definitely true. I'll just put it lightly, like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for completionist's sake, you know, we've, we've covered the mother as being the mother of all complexes. I'd quite like to, to tackle the father, again, just, just for completion's sake. And you said that the mother is connected to the anima as well, but obviously we've got this, this contrasexual problem that exists, a lot of it being sort of a myth that's thrown up around it. So I imagine a myth and a question that someone might have, which, which might be real, I'm not, not entirely sure, legitimate question, is for a man, he's got his mother, and that's going to influence on his anima. And that's going to be the mother of all complexes. Is it reverse for a woman that is her father, which is generally going to pose the biggest problem? Well, it, it, it's very different, you know. Uh, and again, I'm talking about statistically average, if you like, or, or normative uh, family relationships and even gender identity. So if I can just get that out the way first, that, you know, I, I'm limiting it to that for the sake of a, a broad bandwidth explanation. But it is different when you introduce issues of gender identity and whether you have uh, same-sex parents, etc., you know, say two male, two female parents, or whatever, whatever the the political climate of the day wants to suggest uh, for a specific uh, case. But even with the traditional setup, it is different for women because they are born of the same gender, born of the same biological sex. So. I'll come back to that, I think, uh, in a moment. But the, men are different to, to, to women immediately, right off. And they are so different. There's a quality of strangeness and even collectiveness, too, um, that women don't experience because they bond initially to their, their mother, their female uh, caregiver. And, and if they're breastfed, and not all children are, and not all children have been breastfed, uh, particularly in the last century or so. But if they have been, and if they're breastfed to an extensive extensive period, then there's, there's an effect of that in terms of bonding to their own gender, to their own biological sex, that you don't see with um, female children who are bottle-fed or who are weaned early. Now, that can... I'm saying can now, I'm qualifying this, I'm not saying there's any general law here, but it can affect how they bond to men. Because men are so strange and so separate from them. 
that the father tends to blend into the background with men generically, which is why I think Jung said that the animus is a collective rather than an individual figure. So there, there is an issue there. Um, for, for, for boys, it's, the, it's not the same. It is, the, it is definitely different. And that's why I always introduce that um, suggestion of a force experiment. That imagine if you, as a, as a male child, were born from your father, not your mother. So your, your male parent was your birth mother and say your father breastfed you, you would have a completely different relationship emotionally, perhaps even erotically, to your own gender than, than you do. And also women would appear to you to be very different, very, very strange creatures, you know, very, very different. And yet that's the normal experience for girls. So it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy question to address or to solve. How girls do solve that is under instinctive genomic pressure because the genes kick in and force them towards psychosocially and then sexually bonding with men, with boys, men. Uh, but they still carry forward that, that early thing which uh, male children do not have. And that might explain some of the fluidity you get, for example, in female sexuality, which is it's commonly known, it's been researched and, and it is, it seems, a fact. Um, so yeah, the the the, uh, the anima and the animus then as complexes or archetypes, however you want to conceive of them, it's uh, it's different for both, very different indeed. As a therapist, then, because Jung talked about it was in Manus symbols and in other places as well. He said like they're quite generic, broad brush strokes. It's like so if a man has a positive spirit experience of his mother, he might present as X in relation to other women and in relation to himself, because that's how the animal works: is relating to others and and y yourself. But if it's a negative experience, it will change itself up another way. And presumably, it's the same for the dad as well. So as a therapist, and forgive me if this is crude, of course, if someone comes in and has a particular experience of of the mother, are there are there discrete categories that you've discovered? For example, overprotective mother on a man, or abusive mother to a man, and and vice versa for for a woman you know do those categories tend to exist where you can expect to see certain behavior controlling for other factors depending on the relationship between the mother and the son for example being overprotective or be the oedipal situation well these are so difficult to pin down that you can only really do it post hoc it's, it's only afterwards when you look back and you can see that these things were operant say and perhaps causal um but most of us have had paradoxical relationships to our parents and you, you can't just have that as a broad brush at all. In other words, you have to look at the person who comes in and their context and then see for them how that has worked itself through. Um, so I, I'm reluctant again t to say that. Obviously, yes, you can have a, a positive or a negative mother complex and you can have attachment issues and all the rest of it. Uh, but it's not a problem for everyone. Even though that you know siblings may have had the same kind of relationship in, in in the same family to a mother who is perhaps overprotective in the example that you've given, but the child perhaps doesn't turn out the same way as the sibling in terms of the result of that relationship. So I wouldn't give broad brushes at all, and this is an issue I have really. Uh, although, of course, how else can you say anything in a book unless you do give clear examples? But don't generalize from them. You have to work with with what turns up, with what appears. So again, I'm, I'm quite reluctant to to go down that particular rabbit hole because you drag everybody with you and nobody will fit. You'll get a rather crowded rabbit hole. Yes, that's, that's, that's a really useful answer because it's a way of saying people watching. It, it, it's like, don't start with the parents. Don't start with looking for a complex. Start with a symptom. That, 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 that's the way I'd advise anyway. It's like, and, and also, it's like, why would you go looking for complexes in the first place anyway? Like, the reason would be because you're clearly suffering with something. That would generally be it. And then, it, then usually or potentially, it could be mother and or father. Yeah, so the, the mother of all complexes, as, as I said earlier. But with all those caveats in place, that you know, most of us do have a caregiver, and our instinct is to imprint on them. Uh, for all the reasons that I mentioned and our instinct is also to learn from them about relating because when you receive care you can probably give it too because you've been 
trained, conditioned, however you want to phrase that, to be able to do that. So you're relating function then, you are learning off your off your primary caregiver. Um, there's also lifespan development uh, elements too. Uh, for example, with a male child, his first impression of himself as being male will come from his mother rather than his father. And the reason for that is that he will be very, very closely bonded to his mother, with, with all the caveats about the kind of family that we're talking about. So this is the statistical norm I'm, I'm uh, addressing here. So the mother will let him know that he is different to her. He's different. He's like his father or principal male figure in his life, caregiver. But she will confirm that and that will allow the separation from her, or at least a partial separation. At that point, or thereafter, the father should kick in and say, yes, son, you will be like me. You will be a man. Like me, my friends, my peer group, you will grow up and become like me. So that handles that separation and it, it helps the identification to, of the male child to be a male like the father. And he's then beginning to learn what his father complex is consciously, whereas before that, principally, the father may just be a figure who drifts in, drifts out, controls the environment, or does whatever he does do. And this is why he'd be bonded more closely towards his mother, because his mother will meet his needs, his basic instinctive needs. But then the child will come under instinctive pressure to receive confirmation from his father. The mother confirms first, yes, you are different, you are like your father. Oh, right, great. Dad, what do you say? Dad says, yes, you are. Great. But I've got to grow up. How do I grow up? I've got peers, I've got friends. I go into the peer group. The peer group then confirms you as a man in waiting, if you like, who is preparing to go through those stages of adaptation. Now what usually gets a man finally confirmed is sexual, reproductive and social interest from a woman, an adult woman, who says in effect, you're a man, I recognise you as being one because I want to breed, with you, mate selection, I choose you, therefore I confirm you as a man. What your mum said, what your dad said, what your peer group said, I'm saying four stages, complete, everything's fine, lifespan developments, boom, great. Of course, along the way, we acquire an awful lot of frustrations and complexes, you know, and they can get fixated at any one of those points, hence uh, complexes take on a particular character, um, when you get somebody who's fully developed and fully formed, say, then their complexes might take on their adult intelligence and experience. They actually absorb this and they have that as part of their nature, which means that those uh, complexes that, that are developed in later life can be a lot more stubborn sometimes than the ones that are infantile. It's, it's a lot easier to separate yourself off from being a child than it is to separate yourself off from something which is so similar to you. It's very difficult to say this isn't me, rather than to split off parts of your psyche which has got your attributes, it's got your intelligence, it's got your memory, it's got your maladaptive learning, and yet it's fighting you. That's a real neurosis, that's a split, that's an adult neurosis in full full-blown form. So the etiology, if you like, how these things have, have developed and the characteristics that they take on very often reflect the time that they were created. Uh, and sometimes you'll get complexes in alliance with one another, or you'll get an infantile one and an adolescent one and an adult one that will form up and, and form a tripartite system which rotates round in relation to the ego and starts hitting it with different things. As to deal with that, you may theoretically just have to break the connecting bonds or take away the main one which is holding that system together and then it dissolves. So there's lots of different ways of doing it, but you do have to know what you're up against. Well, well cheers for your time today, Steve. We're going to be following this up with a part two. It's like a little series on complexes. We're also going to be covering dreams as well, which dreams do involve complexes quite significantly. So until, and, until then, if you guys have any questions in the comment section down below on complexes so far, we can address those in a Q&A video specifically designated to that. So if you have any questions, now is your time to ask, and we'll make it like an Ask a Depth Psychologist in a way, but more rapid fire for specifically YouTube comments. That'd be quite nice. So until next time, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Steve. And uh, it, it, 
if you'd like to get involved with our community that we built, our Discord server, for example, or indeed asking questions for Ask a Depth Psychologist, as well as loads of other stuff, then check out our Patreon. You might find something over there that you enjoy. We'd really appreciate that. So, see you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. See you again soon.